Well, um, we want to talk about monkeypox because that's something that uh, there is growing concern because now people are talking about the supply and demand side of it. Uh, people want to protect themselves. There's a supply issue uh, nationwide. What are we seeing? Yeah, so it's a good question, and I do appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about it. Um, one of my one of my passions is good science communication and health literacy for the country, especially in the last few years. So I, I really appreciate it. So in, in reality, just for some context, maybe for your story, and you can use it or not, I want to remind everyone that uh, monkeypox is not COVID. Uh, it's not spread through aerosolization or the air. It has a very low reproductive number. It's actually quite tame um, and a reproductive number below one, which means if I have monkeypox, it's very difficult for me to spread it to more than one person. Um, and it takes prolonged contact. It's, it's uh, skin to skin, all the things you've probably been reading about. So just to remind people, it's not, it's not super transmissible. And also to remind everyone that, you know, we're over a thousand cases now in the U.S., about 40 states. Keep that in perspective of 330 million in the population. It's actually quite low, no deaths in the U.S., uh, and so, you know, the vaccine issue is kind of one that it's interesting to watch. You know, you certainly want to be prepared. We have we have two types of vaccines uh, that are approved. One's a little better than the other. Uh, Genos is really the more effective two-dose vaccine that doesn't cause many side effects, and, and it's relatively newer. Um, and we had plenty of that as we started this back in May. So remember, the first case was in May, and we've distributed about, I think, the last I looked at about 132,000 doses have been distributed by HHS. I think Texas has got, you know, several thousand of those. There've been a, about 20 cases in, in Texas with a lot of them in, in the Houston area. So, you know, in my professional opinion, I think we're fine, uh, but certainly we've been distributing those vaccines to people at high risk, uh, immunocompromised individuals, because that's those who are at most at, at uh, concern. In general, when you get monkeypox, it resolves in two to four weeks on its own. Most people are not going to have major issues. They're going to isolate. They're going to wait it out, and it's going to go away. That's kind of the, the truth behind the infection. But having said that, um, just to make sure uh, that we have plenty of vaccine on hand, the national stockpile, HHS, has gone out. Uh, they have ordered, I believe, two and a half million additional doses that's supposed to be here a little later in the year. And then uh, more recently, you may have seen that the United States has went and obtained, or at least they're on their way, about 800,000 doses from Denmark. And those are coming in um, and they take a little bit of time because those doses have to come in at, at cold storage on planes and they can only get about 100 to 150,000 at a time uh, delivered, but those are coming. So uh, it so sounds like they're starting to roll out. Sorry to cut you off, rolling no, out okay. more and more. Um, I think that what I'm seeing is there's kind of that concern with people seeking that protection now. And so when you have it only being rolled out to certain groups, uh, people that have been exposed to somebody. And so if somebody hasn't been exposed and they want to get that protection, do you think it's time to roll it out to that population of people who maybe don't know that they were exposed, but they just want to be protected? Right, right. I think, I think, and I think most experts would say this with me and healthcare officials, they're really going to look at that as a risk analysis, a risk analysis, because you can't just start handing out, you know, thousands of doses of monkeypox uh, because people just want it. Um, if you're not in a risk group, if you haven't traveled to Africa, if you haven't, you know, had known exposure with somebody that has had monkeypox, then probably you're not going to be on the highest priority right now. Now, if something happens and we have, you know, a greater community spread and we start seeing clustering and, and, and greater numbers pop up, that might change. You know, you might go in and say, OK, let's look at um, let's look at Harris County, for example, in Texas. We see something happening there. Let's go in and let's drop in, you know, several thousand doses in X city and try to ring that uh, ring that vaccination effort around that area. That's kind of the next level of effort, usually from a public health standpoint. 
but I don't see right now, uh, especially in Texas, I haven't really seen that being talked about. I know in New York, if you've seen some of the information in the last day or so, they seem to really be requesting lots of vaccine. I haven't dug into that too deep, but you know, in certain communities, uh, we know this is kind of in certain communities of sexual behavior, and that tends to be more uh, concerning, obviously, in those populations. So perhaps that's part of it. If you have higher populations of those practices, then you might look at that uh, as a way to, to control the disease. But I haven't seen that really in Texas right now. Yeah, and that's what I saw out of New York. And I believe, um, I want to make sure I'm accurate on this, but I believe I saw that cases there are doubling. Um, so they've had these large clinics, so much demand that they're having to shut down and wait until they have the supply and they have it available for people there. So is it time to have that same availability in Texas? You know, without knowing the actual numbers at this at this time, I, I just don't know the demand in Texas, but everything I've seen up through about several days ago, I don't believe there's a need right now for that. Again, if that's if that's changed in, in the last 24 hours, that may not have come out through my sources. But if it starts doubling or you start seeing, you know, hundreds of cases versus dozens uh, and maybe even thousands of cases, hundreds, it will kind of depend on what's happening. Is that spread out through our entire state or all of a sudden are you seeing, you know, 700 cases pop up in Travis County in Austin or something like that? That is when I think public health officials would look at that situation and perhaps start with a more localized effort to um, utilize vaccination a little more effectively if they needed to. Again, it really comes down to, um, you know, there's a lot of things going on here. And so one of the things you can do with monkeypox a little more effectively is contact trace. It's a slower acting transmission. If you find 10 people uh, that have it and you can identify their contacts and you can get those people notified and, and maybe you do vaccinate those individuals and you get everybody isolated, you don't necessarily have to come in and just try to mass vaccinate a city. Uh, and, and remember, you have to keep in mind supply and demand. You don't want to burn up vaccine when you don't need to. So all of those considerations from a public health standpoint have to be taken into consideration. Is there any other intel you could share with the um, state's vaccine supply, what we anticipate to get? I understand that I believe it's up to the counties to order the supply, but um, does the state expect to have a larger number of doses here coming up? Yeah, my, my information, my sources, I don't really, I really don't have a lot of information that you probably don't have right now. I know that, um, uh, the leaders in the public health department and stuff, when I look in, in that area and talk to some of my individuals, they talk about that about 200 doses have gone out statewide and about half of those have gone to the Houston area for whatever reason. Um, and ultimately, Texas has been saying we have plenty in, in, um, in you know, supply if something happens. So that's about all I know at this point. I would imagine Texas has, you know, several thousand doses on hand because, because that's kind of what has happened. They've distributed it based on population and needs around the country. Um, and of course, New York has been um, pushing pretty hard the last few days. So they may be first in line if, if that's deemed necessary. Um, it just, seems that as we learn more about this, because it's new and it seems like, you know, we're barely getting through COVID and now there's right. this whole other thing that people are beginning to worry a little bit about. Um, and so when you look at transmissibility, we're starting to learn more. And I remember with COVID that kind of changed as we learned more. Right. Is this transmissible by particles in the air? Not, not to anything that historically is known or anything that's currently happening to my knowledge. Again, for context, I'm gonna back up a little bit. I'm, I'm, I really appreciate you asking that question because um, you know, SARS-CoV-2 was a novel virus. We had really zero information. And, and our assumption when we started out was that it was gonna behave like flu. That was actually a poor surrogate. Now we know that it's, it's aerosolized. It is often asymptomatic. And so the, the traditional model is you deal with people that have symptoms. 
A lot of times you don't know that with COVID, it's just being spread by asymptomatic people. That is not typically the case with monkeypox. We have a pretty good handle on it from really probably seven, eight decades ago. Uh, we first you know, identified it back in the 50s. We, we have vaccines for it. We have antivirals for it. We understand the transmission. Now, could something change a little bit? Sure. I mean, viruses are equal opportunity uh, at infecting and changing. That's what they do. In fact, I often say viruses are going to virus. Uh, you can do everything you want to do and they will surprise you. Viruses will make you look really stupid at times uh, if you think you understand them. So their goal is to infect, amplify, and move on. And that's what they do. Uh, but we do understand uh, monkeypox if we look at the history and we kind of looked at what's happened up to now. So again, I, I think most experts would agree that we're not in a panic mode by any, any sense of what's happened as you compare it to uh, COVID. But certainly um, what I've been mentioning to many news services and, and colleagues and friends is that it's really a good reminder. Um, you know, everybody, everybody was kind of done with COVID, right? Even though it's not done with us. So general population in general, you know, they're kind of done with it and that's understandable. Monkeypox, when that happened in May, in reality, for me as a longtime public health professional going back almost three decades, I've been dealing with this for three decades. There's always something coming up and, and the public and the government and professional organizations are gonna have to learn this lesson, I'm afraid over and over again, that we can't let our guard down we need to have surveillance in real time, all the time, eternally. We need stockpiles of things that we can ramp up actively and quickly. And we need funding uh, to support that. And it's not a popular thing uh, with respect to funding, but it's, it's as important as the Department of Defense, in my opinion. Uh, microbes are just as deadly as enemies and terrorists. And in fact, they're more deadly if you look at the data. Um, I had one other question that just popped up, uh, came to mind, is the rate at which it has spread, does it surprise you at all? Is it typical with this sort of illness? You know, a little bit. You know, one of the things you have to remember up until we've had a couple of these incursions into the U.S. in 03, we had a, a, a population of animals that came out of Ghana actually popped through Texas and then got spread out of over about six cases. I was working at the Department of Health in Austin when all that happened. So that was our first kind of surprise. And then we had a couple of travel associated cases in 18 and 21 to Maryland and some other states. But typically we don't deal with this in the United States. This is more of an African continent and some other places that you see it. And it's quite regular there. It's, it's endemic. Uh, it moves around. They have hundreds of cases at a time. They have some mortality, not crazy mortality, but some. And so, you know, I think it's just, again, something we're not used to seeing. And it is kind of different. And I think that's why you see the concern a little bit with respect to, you know, kind of what's going on. It's in this population of people that seem to be confined primarily to um, gay people or men who have sex with men and things like that. But it's still not been... Um, to, to date, right now, there, there's still no one saying this is a sexually transmitted infection. It's a close contact, prolonged exposure infection, which can occur in anyone, any group of people, whether it's intimate, whether it's sexual intimacy or not, it can be in other routes. And so right. I guess that's the surprise when you ask me, am I surprised? It's just kind of interesting from a scientific standpoint that it's in those groups and it's popping up you know, in over 40 states now. So are we, are we testing better? Do we have better diagnostics and we're seeing it better because we're looking for it? That tends to happen. If you're not looking for it, you wouldn't know it's around. Um, and, and so all those factors are kind of interesting to me as a scientist. Do you feel that more testing around it and a better understanding is needed to make sure that a group, a marginalized group isn't stigmatized? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's one of the things I've been carefully discussing uh, with multiple individuals is that, um, you know, it's really not about in the individual group. Again, what I said earlier, viruses are equal opportunity uh, infectors. They will, they will, they have no bias, right? And so going all the way back to HIV, 
and hepatitis C and how people try to stigmatize different groups of people. That's not what we want to do. Uh, we want to identify the agent. We want to identify those who are infected and we want to get them isolated and treated, uh, vaccinated if necessary, and approach it from a public health standpoint, not from a group of people that might be uh, you know, worried about it. Now, having said that, we are watching that type of, of community dynamics so that perhaps we can be more preventative, more educational, uh, so that people do understand that that close contact uh, is part of the transmission cycle. And so that's just the reality of the biology of the virus and how it, how it moves through populations. Well, you've been amazing. Um in sharing so much. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much for going in depth with everything. I think as people start to learn more about it and try to get a better understanding, this is definitely a big help.